Hey everyone, welcome to the show and today isn't just an ordinary episode because today marks the second year anniversary of Make More Art the podcast. Wow, it feels so great to be able to say that out loud. After interviewing over 100 artists here on the show, people often wonder how we're able to sustain the interviews and topics. And I will always say with a smile on my face that it is because of the stories that the artists share during the interviews. Everyone has a story to tell. And here at Etcher, we've got a good one. So to celebrate the second year anniversary of the podcast, we are sharing with you the Etcher story. And who would be more fitting to share it with you than the founders, right? So it is a privilege and an honor to interview two of the most amazing human beings who are also creative and yes, nothing short of brilliance. We'll share with you the origin story of Etcher brand, how it all started, and a preview of what's up ahead for Etcher and our community. So please welcome to the show, Yan Zhu and Simon Frisbee. Hey, this is Jesse from Etcher. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. So Etcher, normally, when I tell people that I work for Etcher, um, doing the hosting uh, for their podcast, People would ask, what is Etcher? And that's a very interesting name. How did you come up with, I mean, how did the founders uh, come up with the name? So I guess I will probably finally get that answer with interviewing the founders of Etcher. So Simon and Jan, who came up with the name Etcher? I think Simon might have, or probably even Darren. Darren Yo, who, who's our other co-founder. Mm-hmm. You certainly know me. Um, <laughs> I, I think the story being, this is actually quite a bit of a obscure word, right? So, um, you know, we, the original product was art satchel. And, you know, that's, for those who doesn't know, is essentially our first product. Uh, you know, it's kind of a versatile bag, really allows you to, you know, work inside, the studio or you know outside the door so the idea was really to allow people to sort of you know sketch edge do create art anywhere they are um and that's where the word actually come about i think you know first factor is it's essentially the only word you know uh we find other companies haven't got trademarks uh, or you know registered on on the other brand, so that that was a sort of pragmat- pragmatic side of it. Um, you know, the second part was essentially that heritage or legacy, right, around the the first original art product, and and that's you know I think that's where the name came about. Um, and the word lab is also interesting, right? I think it, it kind of yeah. epitomized the sort of spirit of idea right we, we love to try different things right like you know products designed by artists for artists uh, right we're sort of trying to yeah be a little bit more creative and innovative in that regard very interesting background yeah and, and finally i have my answer as to why it's extra and also that tagline creating products for artists mm-hmm. that's because you saw the need, right? Um, especially the the backpack um, that you guys created. Yes. Now, I guess we're a few steps uh, forward. So let me take it back a little bit um, of how everything started. I'm always interested in it with, with you and Simon started Etcher. So take me through that journey of how you guys came up with a plan to start up the company. Because... Mm. How long have, have we been operating? Because it has been five years, 20, 2017. Yeah, yeah okay. it's actually just coming, you know, uh, over five years, which makes mm-hmm. me realize time flies. Uh, half a decade. Yeah. Well, um, having fun. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, so obviously Darren was a friend of Simon. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, he's a digital artist. Uh, concept artist, you know, he's Melbourne-based. He's got this really interesting product. Um, you know, he said, hey, you know, I've got 
you know, this really interesting product. He's done Kickstarter himself. I think he's got like, you know, 900 ish backers. And he brought that product to Simon. I think that was, you know, that was truly mind blowing, right? In terms of its versatility, okay. in terms of its quality. We just mm -hmm. never seen something like that. Um, and from our point of view, like, you know, we always, you know, interested in, you know, just developing like a real product to the world. You know, our background was sort of, in, you know, consulting slash banking. Um, and we really want to bring something tangible, right, to the community. Um, and I, we thought our community was, you know, really good. Number one, art industry itself hadn't really saw innovation or disruption probably for centuries, not decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and second, we thought, you know, the art community is also a really interesting community, right? Like, you know, it's probably not the largest community, but it's got that really strong vibe, right? And, and people are very strongly connected and bounded. So they thought that that's like a really good community, right? Because, you, you know, if you can be like a product-led company, you want a community that really backs you no matter what. And they thought that would be like a very good community uh, to obviously, you know, start the venture and, and hopefully we can give something back. So, you know, then, you know, the journey sort of really just started there and never looked back. <clears throat> And keep on going and moving forward. Simon, anything that you would like to add to that? So John uh, just gave me a walkthrough of how everything started with you and Darren being friends and how Darren um, thought of this idea and um, brought you the product. And that's pretty much kickstarted everything. Exactly. Yeah, I think you know, Darren, uh, Darren had a, a really interesting following, uh, you know, being a, a kind of career artist. And, um, you know, he, he definitely brought along some fantastic supporters in the early days and gave us a lot of direction. Um, and, and, and then I, I suppose from, uh, you know, from the carry products, it just kind of evolved from there. And we started working with the likes of Marion on the mini palette and Erwin on the sketchbooks. And, uh, yeah, just got to, got to know the art community and the artist community. And, you know, it's, it is a wonderful community. Everyone's very supportive. And, um, you know, it's a pleasure to be a part of it. Yeah. Yes, sir. I think the mini palace is actually Stephanie. Something minor, but I think it's important <laughs> to, 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 to correct it. <laughs> yeah. You guys both talked about how the community played a major role in the journey of Etcher. And that's also what I love about working for Etcher. And every time that I interview artists here on the podcast, it's always that community, the sense of community and getting people together, especially within the art community that really propel you to uh, get your voice out there. Well, in this case, for, for Etcher, um, the brand itself. Now, in terms of mission and vision for, for Etcher, when you guys started, so there was, um, there was a product, right? The the carrier mm. for, for, that artists use wherever they go, which is really, really a, a good product to have, especially for artists. How did you make up the decision to move forward and add in more um, art products before venturing into the education platform? Right, two sides of it, right? So from a customer point of view, it's always, it's a natural decision, right? So once you begin to like a brand, uh, you know, have develop a bit of a loyalty you naturally mm -hmm. would like to right use more say more variety right of that product and and that's probably not a unique thing we've done here that's essentially right you, you talk about you know nike started specializing in you know runner shoes uh lululemon you know yoga pants so th that's kind of you know a bit of a natural decision here it's really from the point of view of how do they make a customer more loyal and, you know, we can offer them better selection and variety. I think the second point of view is really out of necessity, right? From mm. business or commercial point of view, because if you think about, um, you know, the art statue itself, right? It's a great product. It's durable. 
Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the more durable it is, you know, a customer will just buy that once, love it so much, and, and you know, never see us again. Um, that's yeah. obviously, you know, not not the best product to build a durable and successful company commercially. So, mm -hmm. so we sort of think about how do we get into the fast moving consumable space, right? The likes of sketchbook, watercolor, uh, right? So it's really truly consumable. You know, people will come back periodically and, and also the, the market size for, for that sort of thing is also significantly larger. It's really the thesis of leveraging of the strong brand awareness we had, the loyalty we have as a customer, and continuing to, you know, put forward, you know, the best product uh, we could possibly source. Uh, and, uh, you know, th that's the kind of the spirit and, and frankly speaking, the model, right? And obviously you mentioned mini palettes and the perfect sketchbook, same idea, DNA, being part of the DNA, right? So somebody out there, you know, in the community got a phenomenal product. How do we leverage off the infrastructure, logistics, manufacturing capability we have mm -hmm. and, and make things, right, a bigger scale uh, and hopefully also cheaper cost? to the broader audience. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, just, to, just to add to that, I think it's been really interesting to see how our audience has gradually evolved. I think with Darren and, and with the carry range, we, we probably had more of a animator, illustrator, digital kind of uh, aspiring professional audience. And, and then, you know, when we, when we sort of moved to the, the mini palette with Stephanie, you know, we found Stephanie, she had a wonderful project uh, on Kickstarter with the mini palette. And, uh, you know, we sort of thought, well, how can we kind of uh, continue, you know, continue with the production of the mini palette and kind of bring it under the Etcher, under the, um, yeah, the Etcher brand. And that started our transition towards, I guess, more hobbyists, more watercolor, mm -hmm. more kind of, um, yeah, I, I suppose more sort of traditional art. Um, and then the logical next step was was Irwin's um, perfect sketchbook, which once again he'd done a really successful Kickstarter uh, and had a nice uh, nice community, a nice little following. But for him, I think the pain point was he loved designing products. He's a wonderful artist, uh, but everything that comes with that with designing and shipping a product right is 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 challenging um, and time consuming. And so we sort of said, well, let's, let's sort of roll that under the Etcher brand as well. Let's work together. Um, and so that kind of spirit, uh, as Jan said, of kind of identifying really cool ideas and products that artists have come up with. Um, and even if they've already been commercialized, kind of commercializing them to a greater extent and making sure that they come into existence and, um, you know, are kind of available on an ongoing basis, you know, through a retail network, through our website, um, and then on from there, I mean, Jan can probably talk about the next bit, you know, beyond the product side of things. Yeah, I think that's probably in your, you know, uh, coming up questions, Jesse, um, you can ask about, you know, the five-year plan or the, the grand vision. Yeah. So, um, I'd like to, to just quickly pick up on what you shared about the product. So for Etro Lab, right. And what one single, I think, same or common denominator from the products you create is you work with artists. And that's a very interesting take when um, creating a product. And Jan, you talked about the strategy of how you came up with direction and the, the mission of the team of, or the vision rather of how to move forward. So starting with the, with the arts uh, satchel and then moving into different products, but it's all about collaborating and partnering with artists and identifying mm -hmm. what will work for, for our specific market base. Now mm -hmm. so that's for Etcher Lab. Now we move into the Etcher Studio. Mm -hmm. <sighs> So which year did we start at the Etcher Studio? And can you take me through that process and that journey of making that decision to have Etcher Lab and the Etcher Studio? And yeah. why did you think there's a need to separate both instead of just doing just one under the um, mm -hmm. Etcher Lab? Yeah. yeah. So 
That's actually a really a uh, good question, uh, right? So I'll break it up into multiple components. Uh, so I, I, I think precisely we started at your studio around September 2020. That's when we first launched the initial pilots. So it was during the pandemic. Uh, it was sort of a, you know, a natural perfect storm. Uh, where you got a lot of people locked down at home, bored. You got art teacher no longer able to teach. You got students who are still keen to learn. And it so happens through Atra Lab, you know, the art supply business we had, uh, you know, a lot of our customers, uh, you know, were either, you know, semi-professional artists or artists, right? Like a lot of them are still keen to learn and develop. I mean, a lot of them are actually also are teachers themselves. So it's really a bit of a natural decision at that point, initially, you know, it's not like, hey, they go, this is a great idea, we're gonna try. I, I think there's people out there, you know, crying out, say, hey, you know, we'd love to do some, you know, online classes and courses uh, during the lockdown. So, so that's really how that idea sort of, you know, naturally, you know, came along. Um, and, and also, from our point of view, right, we always somewhat love to get involved into content, right? So I think physical products and content, they are sort of like milk and coffee. They just naturally go together. There's certain industries where I believe uh, content and product are just naturally integrated, right? Uh, you, you know, cooking is one space, right? You, when you got ingredients, you are naturally inspired to find recipes. When you got mm -hmm. recipes, you just make you want to shop and get a fresh ingredients. I think our supply is another perfect sector, right? Where that's, that is just true, right? Where you got so many interesting art supplies, right? You want to know how, how, you know, how do I make the most out of them, right? How could other people, different sort of techniques and mediums, uh, and vice versa, right? Once you got some interesting, uh, courses that intrigue you, you, you want to get out there and get some new art supplies and try different things. So it's really, you know, a bit of a virtuous cycle, right? So content and product. So we want to mm -hmm. get that flywheel going. Um, and in terms of the separation, right? So we actually had lab and studio on the same portal for probably about half a year. Mm -hmm. So the separation decision was really uh, number one, I think, to, to many people, this is how they think about the, the, the natural experience, right? Customer journey. Um, they'd love people to start with content because they believe more people will try content first and, and then our supply. And this is actually backed up by numbers as well, right? This is, this is not something... Right, this is a part of actress DNA. Everything got to be backed up by number, right? So the cross conversion from they find content side to product side is always structurally higher, like three or four times higher than product to content side. Okay. Uh, so they go, okay, that that was interesting. And the second thing is, um, you know, I, they believe the market potential for art learning because they focus on beginner. Uh, right, a hobbyist segment is actually substantially larger, right, than the actual art supply, right, where we kind of focus towards a premium end of that spectrum. And hence, you know, by separating the two portal really made sure, um, you know, we kind of maximize that exposure, right, to the particular audience group. And also we can truly optimize that UX, UI experience. If people come to learn, right, that experience is very clean, right? So all you had is amazing content. And, you know, we, we, we still maintain that uh, linkage, right, on both portals. So there's still a clean link that can send people either way, but we sort of balance off, right, you know, making sure people, you know, won't unnecessarily, right, almost get fatigued with either products or content they don't want to see. Mm -hmm. um so so that was really you know the sort of thinking at that point in time <clears throat> to separate both <clears throat> thanks yeah, yeah, someone would like to add to that yeah i'll just add to that quickly yeah, i think uh 
you know, when we, when we made the decision to kind of start Etra Studio, it, it, it was kind of also born out of a few little tests that we'd run. So, for example, at the start of the pandemic, I believe we did, uh, we started doing like artist studio tours um, mm-hmm. you know, where we would kind of have artists take over our Instagram account and kind of do Instagram lives about their, their studios and things like that and obviously got a lot of engagement and people were really excited to see that when they were sort of locked down. Um, and we also, uh, you know, said, well, why don't we start teaching, uh, through YouTube, you know, just do a few lessons here and there with, with Erwin and, and some other teachers and just sort of see if the people enjoy it. And I think when we did that, it wasn't necessarily, we weren't necessarily thinking about, uh, okay, we're going to start at your studio. It was more like, okay, this is good for the community. It's good for our art supplies brand you know, and, but it sort of, you know, took off from there. And, and that's when we decided to really um, push Etra Studio a lot further. Um, and to add to Jan's other point about, uh, you know, separating the two sites, I think the other thing is that a lot of our teachers, you know, while they're always welcome to use Etra products and we kind of, uh, you know, are very happy to send them to them for the classes, we don't want to sort of force them to people if they say, oh, no, I have a particular preference for a, a Princeton mm-hmm. brush or a Windsor & Newton or Daniel Smith watercolour. Um, and, and so, you know, allowing them to uh, use some extra products where it's a natural fit but also use whatever brand of supplies they want, uh, which they're mo- you know, most used to, I think is really um, a key to the artist being authentic to, to you know, their own method. Um, and you know, I, I just, I think it, it's a lot better feeling than everything kind of being etra, etra, etra. So. Right. Thank you, Simon. That's actually what I've gathered from, from what you both shared is that for every, uh, product or say a platform that Etra creates, it is always referencing to the customer journey. And I love when Jan mentioned about you know, the fatigue of having just have to go through one platform where they would want to learn something instead of just buying the products. And then Simon, to your perspective, is that that thinking of the community and how they how they use a certain product, how they would like to learn, giving them the freedom to be able to use whatever is available to them, but us providing the platform where they will be able to learn, um, referencing to the teachers that we have on board. I just love that idea about Etcher because every time that I interview people or when I was hosting classes, it's and when I read through our Facebook group as well, with the engagement that we're getting, it's really that sense of community and what they keep on repeating about Etcher is that they make us feel that we're a part of the product and the platform that they create, that we are on top of mind every time they create something. So I guess the follow-up question to that is given that there are other learning platforms and tons of products out there, brands for, for art supplies, what do you think that First is the catalyst that drive Etcher to continue on with its mission and vision and to provide uh, a learning platform and supplies Mm -hmm. catered to our specific audience base. But at the same time, the other question to that is what makes us stand out? What is it something about Etcher that would be, that would you as founders of the, the company would say that we are, we exist because this is our why and this is why we, you as a student as an artist would want to collaborate with us or would want to learn uh, from us mm. through the platform? Yeah. I mean, very good question. And uh, this is a, frankly something we internally, you know, been debating a lot. And, mm-hmm. you know, we think that's important, right? Mission and value and why we exist. Um, so I think, as you rightfully said, right, art industry is not a new industry, right? So yeah. in comparison to technology or other sectors, you know, it's probably has existed thousands of years. And we very we see very limited innovation and disruption so far, right, in this space. Um, and part of part of it, I think, I believe, is you know, the, the, the inertia, right? So you know, the incumbents, the brands are focusing on making products and the distribution channel focusing on fulfilling and they sort of live in this very safe right disaggregated uh you know 
a segment. And part of it, I think, also to do with what I say, you know, that customer obsession, but also provide truly integrated service and content. And, you know, I'd like to use Amazon as an example, right? And, you know, Amazon today offers content, offers products, offers cloud computing, right? Offers seamless experience, music, right? Uh, Kindle, everything, audiobook. And you just need one login, one account, you get access to everything, right? And I feel that is, at least to me, wearing the consumer's hat, the future trend, right? Because mm -hmm. life gets too busy, right, in the modern world. Nobody wants to log in 20 portals and have really fragmented service. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's kind of probably the, really the, I would say the fundamental difference, what Atri is about, right? They want to kind of really bring that seamless integrated product content and actual offline physical experience, right? Which we we'll, we we'll want to, you know, launch at some point in time, uh, hopefully in the near future. And, and really making sure, right, one customer, but you get that immersive, right, exposure mm -hmm. to everything around creativity. Right. They say, how do they sort of, you know, ignite your creativity, right? How, how do they make sure this one brand there, no matter what you do, right, uh, that can propel you, uh, you know, to make more, more art and make, you know, make the world, uh, you know, more worthwhile to live in. So, so that's really sort of the, 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 the grand vision uh, in terms how we want to differ from, from, from other company. Um, and also, you know, just to follow on, right, like, you know, what, what, what does that mean, right, in the near term, you probably begin this. So if you understand that, you, you probably would understand a lot of the things we are doing, right, to some people might be seemingly random, like, hey, <laughs> you know, you said you're going to focus on our supply, why all of a sudden you get into content? And then maybe when we do, you know, launch that physical offline uh, experience, people go, wow, why, why you get into this, right? But if you kind of understand the overarching mission, uh, you know, why they exist, what is us about, you probably would understand, right? All the same as Amazon, right? This seemingly random move all coming back to that same core, right? How do we making sure a person maximizes, right? convenience and, and our structure exposure, right? High quality convenience, customer obsession. This is what we're about. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Simon. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Jan's covered it pretty well. I, a few things to add, you know, I think, you know, Jesse, you said at the start that Edge has been very much focused on the community and we always kind of have been working with the community that we've built I think that's just a that j just the sort of result of the fact that we started out on Kickstarter, and with Kickstarter, the community brings things to life, and and you know you kind of continue to to launch products through that platform and build your community, and and that's something that's very different than a lot of other art supply brands um, or art learning platforms, right? Because many of these art supply brands are hundreds of years old, um, yeah. and you know a lot of these other learning platforms are catering to lots of different skills, right? They do, you know, graphic design or cooking or whatever it is as well. So I think Jan's right. You know, we sort of said, well, we want to just focus on art. Uh, we've got our suppliers brand. Uh, you know, we've got our content, which is about teaching people art. We want to do the offline events and we kind of just want to keep expanding that universe, but keeping art at the core. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, when I talk to, uh, you know, art supplies, other art supplies brands, and I sort of say, oh, look, we're, we've got this online learning platform, um, but we're coming at it from the art world. We're not coming at it from the, the tech world. Um, mm. So, you know, it's a little bit different. And, and that's kind of, I guess, uh, one of the other things that differentiates us, just always keeping, you know, art at the core of everything we do. Thank you, Simon. That's a... 
you both made really good points about where we stand and what's our why behind Etcher and why we do things the way we do here at Etcher with, from the brands, I mean, from the art supplies down to the content that we produce on every uh, media platform. Now, let's talk about a little bit because this is something that was recently launched uh, from Etcher, right? Mm -hmm. The subscription model. And... Uh, and there was a lot of buzz around it, um, asking why is Etcher moving to the subscription model? Um, initially, we had a different way and strategy of putting our content and getting our students yes. sign up for the classes. Can you take me through um, that decision process and yes. what was the, I guess, rationale of switching from, you know, you can purchase the, a, a class recording versus us moving into the subscription model? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's frankly a decision. I think internally we definitely had multiple rounds of discussions. It actually took us a while to implement that. Um, again, I'll probably talk about it from business point of view and also from customer point of view, right? Why we think it makes more sense. I, I think number one, from customer point of view, if you look at the actual consumption frequency of content, right, and, and plot that on curve, um, I would say our shape is not, you know, sort of the typical bell shape, normal distribution. It's more sort of like, I'd say like a binary distribution, like, the, the, you know, a group of people who end up, you know, we had customer before we had subscription models spend thousands of dollars buying the content, right? Because they love it so much. And then mm -hmm. we have a very long tail of people, right? Just spend a little bit of money, right? Here and there. And so by switching to a subscription model, I think automatic, automatically help the people, right? Who enjoy your content the most, right? It's almost like you'll open a buffet, you know who will come, the heavy eaters, right? Um, so that's really coming back to the principle, right? We don't want people to spend thousands of dollars on content, right? We want them to say, uh, you know, up to just over $120, you get unlimited access, right? So financially, that would allow you, there would be a lot of people that are not in a financial position to spend thousands of dollars, right? Get, getting access to the content, but we'd love, we'd love, those people to consume more, right? So it's really, so that that was the decision, right? Really, how do we make sure, you know, that exposure is not only amazing experience, but also affordable experience, right? To the heavy consumers. So that that was to the, right, the, um, you know, far long side of that spectrum. And then if you think about it, if you like a uh, transactional customer, right? You sort of come once and, and get the content, then you might sort of stay in active for a while. So subscription was really designed uh, to ultimately inspire you to consume more content, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and initially uh, when we launched the subscription service, what we want to do is to get people to try the subscription right away and, and, and then become a subscriber, right? But then they find that that was a super unnatural experience, right? And if you, uh, you, you know, if you pay attention to the site, you probably realize we also had the t uh, you know, transactional service uh, available again. So, so that was really designed to cater both people, right? So, hey, say naturally, they, they don't want to sell. This is our philosophy. They don't want to sell people something they fundamentally don't need, right? Um, as a company, that's just against our belief, right? Do not sell monks a con because they don't need it, right? Yeah. So, and, and to me, people should be, when they sell them subscription, it should be a natural decision, right? They, to, I'm already consuming that much content. I'm genuinely better off if you introduce a subscription model to me, right? I, I am just genuinely financially better off because I'll end up spending that much money anyway, right, to get your content. Um, so, so that's probably the key thing from customer point of view. 
And from business point of view, commercially, having a subscription model uh, really solves our part of our cash flow uh, problem, right? So because the challenge, if you think about it, is you spend money to acquire a customer, and that customer hopefully, right, will stay, uh, you know, for a while, right? They sort of repeat, repeat, repeat. And the problem when you scale uh, is although a customer in the long run, right, over the course of two, three, four, five years, right, you become profitable. But the problem is you spend more money to acquire them upfront, right, than how much they would spend on their first transaction. And that created a problem for us because as you scale, this is a problem for Uber, for, for many companies in hyper growth space. You scale quicker and quicker, you begin to have a large and large cash uh, black hole, right? You need to fill. So, so really for us, that was a strategy to sort of really partially mitigate, right? So it's, I'd say it's a win-win to our loyal customer as well as to us. To them, they're getting, you know, the same service packaged up at a substantial discount than what would have cost them, right, under the T-Void model. To us, it's really a way to kind of bring forward some of the cash flow problems. So that allowed us to at least break even, right, uh, on a blended basis upfront. So, so that's, that was really the sort of two core consideration from customer and business point of view. <clears throat> Thank you, Jan. Simon, anything you would like to add to that? Uh, no, I think like the, the only thing to add is that, you know, I, we, we kept the ability for people to purchase, um, you know, classes individually. We knew that was important and that was feedback that we'd gotten. So mm -hmm. I suppose Jan's right. You know, it's, it's really about those that will actually, you know, uh, get, get a financial benefit out of being a subscriber can do so. And those that, you know, perhaps don't consume that much content uh, are better off buying, you know, as they go. I think we actually did the numbers. It was something like if you watch less than three classes a month or something, you're probably better off at the moment to, um, you know, to kind of pay as you go. But over time, you know, we want to add lots of other benefits to the subscription. So, um, you know, we, we want to sort of continue to add value there so that you can say, hey, if I, you know, become a subscriber, I also get all these other benefits um, that will help me to, I guess, continue making art. Thank you. Making more art. I, I think that's the key term there from what you guys shared. And specifically, John, you talked about from a business standpoint, from a customer point of view. And I love how Etcher as well gave our customers the ability to choose whether you would want to pay us to go and if you if you are constantly consuming content, then you're better off with a subscription. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, company would switch to one and then push it to the customer that this is our way forward. And we, you know, we check the numbers, it's back up by by feedback and surveys and all that. But with Etcher, you guys are always referencing to that customer experience and customer journey, which is I mean, from, from my end uh, as a consumer, that's really important because you are considering me and my experience where I'm coming from in every product and services that you are providing. And that's that's really important. Now, um, you know, we've talked about Etcher as a business. We've talked about the strategies and what we where we are right now in terms of the things that we have created in the past from 2017 to now, 2022. Now, if mm -hmm. we say we are looking forward, right? What, where do you see Etcher from now? So we we started with a product, the mm -hmm. art sketch, uh, satchel, then we move into content and now we have a subscription model. Where mm -hmm. do we see Etcher mm -hmm. in five years, would you say? Uh, yeah, you, you know, being an entrepreneur, we always have to be, you know, optimistic. Uh, yes. You know, my, my grand vision for Etcher, I don't know if it's five years, 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, if, if I mention spots, right, there are probably a couple company, right, straight away popping up in people's mind, right? You know, Nikes, Adidas, right? If technology, same. If I say art, people sort of roll their eyes and say, don't know, right? There's sort of no household brand. 
mm -hmm. right? Sort of almost synonymous, right, with, with the word art. And I think, um, you know, weight love, right, to have the chance, this is going to be very difficult, right? You know, just get getting a step of becoming that household brand in, in the art space. Mm -hmm. And when I say art, right, so this is amazing, the disconnection, right? Why in that space there hasn't been a household brand? Something shocked me. Hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of people visit the Louvre Museum itself per year. I just go, that is amazing. If you ask the number of people, uh, you know, have an interest in art or love art, would, you know, love to learn a bit more about art, whether that's art history, art approval, or actually learning art. I think the proportion in community is huge, right? But it's always sort of one of the space where people go, I know nothing about it, right? I always feel a little bit alienated or disenfranchised. I'm, I do not feel I'm part of that community, but I'm, I'm interested, right? And we, we're here to break that barrier, right? And I want to make sure, right, going back to the customer journey or experience where you go, right, naturally, right? What, what, what's the most natural thing to people, right? They, they don't want to force people, right, straight away throw you into the funnel, right? You know, we, we'd love to, for example, collaborate and work with galleries and museums a little bit more, if you at the very start that journey, hey, right, let, let's take you through, you know, some of the famous artists in history, tell you not only the things you already know about them, right, but, but also the technical side of it, right? What makes the art unique and different? Their brush stroke, their techniques, blah, blah, right? And why it's important. And once you become interested, they can go, would you perhaps like to try art learning a little bit yourself, right? Create a bit, bit of art. You know, there are just some, you know, it's hard to describe, right? The intellectual stimulation you get when you create art, that creativity, right? The fun side of it. You'd have just to try it yourself. And once you get into that, we can tell you, right, what are the right art supplies? It's almost like sort of creating that ecosystem, right? Systematically allowing people, making it easy, right? To get the art exposure. Same as Nike, right? Making making extremely easy for people, right? To integrate a bit of uh, you know exercise into their daily routine, and, mm -hmm. and ultimately, you know, I I see the big societal trend. We we getting big data, blockchain, everything seemingly become a bit more scientific. What what truly makes human humans, right? I I think it's a great creative side of things, right? Creativity, yeah. right? So it's used to joke, like, you know, we actually say what we want to do, right, is really art makes us more human, right? So you need to come alive. You need to do art. How, how do we, as a company, being part of that community to make that process just a little bit easier, right? And if we can make anything, you know, big or small contribution on that front, you know, I this is where I, you know, feel we added value as a company. <clears throat> Love that, Pian. Um, that value add from from what you just shared about that whole customer experience and giving them the, that you know, because most of the time people nowadays are very much the, the attention span is very short, right? But and people don't really get to experience and savor things. But with art and creativity, you are given. I guess, an opportunity to do that. And with what Etcher is doing right now is, I guess, adding value to that experience. Simon, anything that you would like to add to that? No, I think uh, Jans once again covered it really well. Uh, the, yeah, you know, beyond beyond just artists who we, we obviously cater to already, like there is a lot that you can get out of art, uh, you know, a lot of joy that you can get out of it just from understanding it and observing it and, and kind of diving a little bit deeper and i think that's the really exciting kind of next phase is you know how can we how can we integrate a bit of art history or a bit of uh you know how can we integrate kind of some some gallery stuff in, into what we do uh mm -hmm. and you know some people might say yeah I, I do actually feel like picking up a paintbrush now and trying something um, but even if they don't i think they'll get a lot of benefit out of just um understanding a little bit more about art and, and hopefully 
you know, it'll just make their lives a little bit better as well. So that's, I think that's where we can have a, a, a much larger impact beyond just the artist community. Love, love that. Um, I guess that's really what I love being part of Etcher as well, is that I know by heart what our mission and vision is and everything that we do here is driving towards that goal. Um, making sure that the community and the people um, who subscribe to our brands, uh, to our products, um, our content, do get the value um, referencing to what our goal is um, for our community and for our students. Now, we've talked about Etcher as a brand, as a service, as you know, um, provider of our supplies. I guess for, for most people who don't know, I guess we've heard the background of Etcher, but I'm pretty sure our students, our community would also like to know more about the founders of Etcher. So uh, I would like to ask a few questions, if you may, Simon and Jan. Um, so you were pretty young when you started um, this whole business, right? And you know, for a lot of people who are at your age during that time when you started, where did you find the courage to kickstart? I mean, to kickstart a start up a company that probably, you know, what were the thoughts that's coming into your mind during that time? Um, how did you overcome the thought of like, this is a huge risk? Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Or was it sort of like uh, an R&D behind it? Can you share a little bit more about that experience? I pretty much would be interested to know. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think for Jan and I, I mean, we've known each other since university, right? So it's been a very long time. Um, and then we went off and kind of did our own thing, uh, you know, working in other companies. Uh, I think, you know, certainly for me and perhaps for Jan as well, it was always like at some point I do want to try something, you know, creating something and building something. And I think, you know, that you can get a lot of joy out of, out of that. Um, and, you know, looking back at, at something that you've, you know, created with a team is, is pretty exciting. So that was always sort of something that I, I did want to do and I knew I wanted to do it. Um, and I think, yeah, like there's obviously uh, leaving the safety and security of a, of a company where you're kind of earning a salary and things is, yeah. is daunting, right? But um, once you have actually made that decision, I think it kind of just becomes... I guess it's like anything that you do that scares you a little bit, right? Once you've done it, it's not that scary anymore. Like there's a lot more things out there to be worried about than yeah. uh, than that. But uh, yeah, you, you've got to look at the the upside and and all of the the benefits and reasons that you're doing it. But um, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a character building experience building a company like. You, there's a lot of you know tough times, a lot of good times, yeah. uh, a lot of new challenges. You have to really grow as a person. Uh, you can't kind of stay in your comfort zone all the time. Um, and I think that's something that people, that's something that I've really realised and that I tell people that are planning on starting a company. It's you know you are going to learn a lot about yourself. You are going to kind. Of, it's it's almost a bit of a, a character building spiritual journey in some respects. Good points. That's actually one of the questions that I had that I have on my list was the lessons that you've learned uh, from from that experience of creating your own business. But you've just nailed several points there, Simon, um, about character building that you learned so much from the experience. And also one thing about overcoming that fear, because I think I've read somewhere that if something scares you might be a good thing to try. And I guess that's what you did. It's where we are right now. Um, that's why we have that shirt. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, so I think to me, um, you know, I always, with, you know, of the mentality, life is such, you know, you was short, right? You, you, you probably, you got 900 months. This is scary, right? And they like, we already consumed five <laughs> so far this year. There's only 900 months, right? Anyone has in their <laughs> lifetime. So to me, <laughs> to make the most out of it, right? Where I think that time's valuable. I think life, why I'm on death bad, I want to minimize the number of regrets I had for this life. I think the biggest, to me, right, the biggest regret would be inability to take risk when you can, right? So, because it's always a path that are unworn, untried. 
ultimately end up, right? People regretting, right? Hey, I should have done this. What could it have become? It probably needs nowhere, right? Statistically, I think starting a company is just more likely to fail, right? But still that spirit of startup, right? That spirit when our ancestor came all the way out of Africa, right? You know, when lighter brother, right? Said, you know, we're going to, right? We're going to fly. When Elon Musk said, we're sending humans to Mars. When something mm -hmm. is important enough, you don't think about risk. You don't, right? And you have to have that grand, right? A grand level, right? Something to community. If you think what you're doing is important enough, you don't think about risk. Something to you personally, when you're on deathbed, you always, this works for me, you always ask, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, I had the opportunity in life. If I don't do it, right, down to that imaginary point, what, would I regret? If the answer is yes, you got to do it. Although at that point in time, you feel like skydiving, right? But once you hop on the plane, you're down, you're afraid, you, right? You stop worrying about fears, right? That moment you feel like you're alive. And, and to me, it's about that, right? That two overlapping that two angle, right? What, what, what I know, what I'm doing, feel like is enough, right? To the community. What I'm doing feel like re reduces the regret of me <laughs> when I'm on deathbed, right? If you got both, you literally wouldn't worry about it. There's no fear, right? I would go in comparison to what people had a hundred years ago, a couple hundred years ago, I go, even if what you do wasn't successful, you fail. You have a very, very decent base, right? Like, you know, you're not going to die out of starvation, right? You're going to get yeah. medicine when you're you. There's nothing to worry about, right? Like literally, I would say if our ancestor didn't take that risk, you wouldn't today live so comfortably. I think it'd be in, in to me, right? That somebody in society have to keep taking on that risk for the, I'd like to believe, you know, a word, the future I'm looking forward to, right? Our descendants can say proudly because, you know, thousands of years, our ancestor keep taking risks. That spirit of venturing got to rock on. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm very well said about taking risks. Also that value add, I guess, that's also one of the things that if something is important, do it. Um, and also to the point about failing and making mistakes, um, you, you, Simon also mentioned this, that along the way, you no, know, there are some high times and low times, but you learn from it. And those lessons that you learn from those failures and mistakes are very valuable because that will propel you to the next phase, which will mm -hmm. get you to be better. So definitely failures and mistakes are really a part, whether you're starting up a company or even learning a new skill, which I know most of our students, our listeners, and um, our customers in nature are very much familiar with, and it resonates with them. Um, Jan and Simon, I had an amazing time um, listening you talk about Etcher as a brand, Etcher as part of the committee, Etcher as a learning platform, and most importantly for myself, being part of the organization. Um, I kept telling Anya, who's our art director as well, that when I joined last year, um, it was one of the best decisions, and Etcher came at a point in my life where it's perfect. I know there's no such thing as perfect. We have the perfect sketchbook, which everyone is raving about, but what I love about this company is one, it's all about community and being part of the Etcher family. It makes me feel that it's home and um, the people here are very warm. So knowing more about you, you too, um, Jan and Simon and the history of how the, the company was created, the reasoning behind why we do things the way we do um, and what it is um, the, 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 at the back of our minds where we create, when we create a product and our content and services who is our top of mind, and that is our customer and our community. It makes me feel really good to be a part of the company who values customer experience or customer centric. So thank you, I guess, um, would be an understatement for not only being part of the second year anniversary episode of the Make More Art podcast, but also for creating such an amazing company and brand. Etcher, um, I know I'll, when we when we look at the the 
feedback um, when we do surveys and uh, the comments and reviews as well on the podcast. It's really priceless to see that everything that you guys have worked so hard through the years, it's really paying off and it's really creating impact to our customers, propelling them to make more art. So Simon, um, Jan, anything that you would like to say to our customers, our students, um, our listeners before we wrap up? Yeah, I'd just love to say, you know, thank you for believing us, right? Startups, you know, most of them die. So, you know, to make that difference, you know, what allowed us to push so far, all coming back to you guys, right? Without you guys, they're going nowhere. So, you know, that's a wholeheartedly, uh, you know, appreciation on behalf of the team, right? You guys are why we exist. And we'd love to be able to, cater your needs, right? Hopefully for many more decades to come. So mm -hmm. thank you again for trusting us, believing us and, and making, you know, what we do more meaningful. <clears throat> and please uh, don't be, don't be strangers. Please reach out to, you know, to us and the team, you know, give us feedback, tell us what you like, what you don't like. I think we just want to continuously hear, you know, hear from the, our community and our customers to make sure that we are sort of heading on a track that they want us to head on and that we're doing things that are, you know, adding value. So uh, it's an ongoing journey and we, we hope to uh, bring everyone on board and, and thank you, Jesse, for, for doing this podcast. I think you're a wonderful host and uh, we really appreciate all your efforts. Thank you, Simon. You guys are amazing. And yeah, like what Simon said, feel free to reach out to us. These guys are the coolest people on earth and so humble that you guys can definitely reach out to and if you have any feedback about our services and our products. Jan and Simon, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me uh, to be part of this episode. I look forward to what's up ahead uh, for Etcher and to continue to be a part of this wonderful organization. Thank you both. Have a great rest of the day. I will speak to you again soon. Thank you. This is truly an episode that I will hold dear to my heart. I hope this gives you a background of what Etcher stands for, our values, mission, and vision. We hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed making it, and that you have been inspired to take on new things, follow your dreams, and yes, to make more art. So celebrate with us and share with us your comments and feedback through the blog post associated with this podcast at astrolab.com slash second anniversary.